Hello everyone, welcome to a video I've been simply dying to make. I found a truly trashed MacBook Pro on eBay for $66. The screen has been snapped off, it's clearly missing many parts, and it's also got a large dent in the corner. Before we open up the box, I'd like to tell you that today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Anyway, let's see if it survived shipping. Actually, in fact, that'd imply that it actually worked to begin with. So, let's see what arrived. Here we've got the MacBook sandwiched between cardboard. I think adding a fragile sticker is a bit of a lost cause, considering the condition of the laptop. Inside several layers of bubble wrap, we get our first look at the victim. Quite literally held together with rubber bands and cling wrap. Taking a closer look at the hinge, it doesn't look too promising. I'd hate to think what happened for the laptop to receive this much damage. Taking the back cover off was pretty easy since it's missing all of the case screws. The display connector is somehow still attached, even though the cable is clearly under a lot of strain. Out of curiosity, I thought I would plug the laptop in and see what happened. I was amazed to see, even though it had no RAM, that the fans actually spun up. After slotting in some RAM, I tried again. The warning beeps were gone and the boot chime actually played. It also appeared as if something was coming up on the screen. First things first, time to remove those busted hinges. They're only going to get in the way, plus they are putting unnecessary strain on the video connector. I can only imagine how much force is required to do this much damage. I used my money box to hold the display up, since the hinges were non-existent, and then tried booting the MacBook. The MacBook detected my installer USB and displayed video, but it looked as if the GPU was failing. I didn't initially realize it, but the back of the MacBook said it had graphical issues. So we can now confirm that the logic board does indeed have graphics related issues. I mean, it's not like we had enough problems to deal with already. And it even says so on the back, but of course the seller did not mention any of that in the eBay listing. So there are two things we can do. The first and arguably easiest thing to do is disable the discrete GPU using software. Or alternatively, I can try reflowing the chip using a heat gun. However, this is really only a temporary measure and there's a good chance I'll kill the logic board entirely. So I'm going to save trying that till the end of the video, just in case I really do kill the logic board. To see if the MacBook will actually boot, I put in an SSD that I used in another MacBook Pro. It did try to boot into macOS, but nothing else would happen. Thankfully, there is a way around this. Following DOSDude1's tutorial, we can disable that failing discrete graphics processor from the command line. I've left a link to this tutorial in the description if you've got the same problem. Once it's typed in, we can reboot the MacBook. And would you look at that? It boots right into macOS. Using DOSDude1's patching tool, I was able to successfully get the MacBook running without the discrete graphics enabled. It's running abnormally slow though, because the battery is completely dead. The serial number on the base of the MacBook led me to believe this was an early 2011 base model. However, this is the high-end, late 2011 quad-core i7 model, featuring a 1GB AMD 6770M that's notorious for failing and, not surprisingly, it has failed. Although the battery has only 253 cycles used, it holds no charge and is the reason this Mac is slow as heck. Now it's time to strip the MacBook down and see exactly what we're dealing with. Unlike the previous videos, the fans aren't all that dusty. But that's probably because someone's taken the machine apart before. After removing all the logic board screws and disconnecting the connectors, it came out really easily. The underside of the board is thankfully not very dusty either. The woefully inadequate heatsink is held in place by six Phillips head screws. Before we see just how bad that thermal paste is, let me introduce you to today's sponsor Skillshare an online learning community with thousands of superb classes ranging from illustration, animation, music production, filmmaking, all the way to web development. A class that really resonated with me was Dale McManus' iPhone Photography that teaches you how to take really good images just using the phone in your pocket. While I don't have an iPhone, the fundamentals were still very relevant for me with my really old Galaxy S9+. Plus. Honestly, I sat there and watched all 51 minutes of the class and even with my prior experience, I learned quite a lot. 
Another aspect I found cool was the fact you can see what members have done after learning new skills from the class. If you're hungry to learn and discover something new, Skillshare has so much to offer. There's no ads and they're always launching new premium classes. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month, giving you access to a diverse library of classes. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two month free trial of premium memberships so you can explore your creativity. So why not join this great online learning community today? Now that is some crusty thermal paste. This era of MacBook Pros run notoriously hot, often reaching 100 degrees Celsius. With some isopropyl alcohol, we can remove the paste. It may be satisfying seeing all of it flake off, but that means the heat from these processes wasn't being transferred very well. It's not too surprising that the GPU eventually failed. Now that they're cleaned off, we can move on to the heatsink. For such powerful hardware, this cooling solution just isn't enough. Ramping up the fans is basically the only way to keep these machines cool. The rest of the components can now be removed. Three Phillips head screws hold the optical drive in place. The subwoofer and speaker can now be removed. The casing has some serious cosmetic flaws as well. The side where the battery indicator is, is dented in, bulging upwards quite significantly. I'll have to remove the battery indicator to attempt to fix that. The thin cable is stuck to the chassis and routed underneath this metal shield. After gently prying up on it, I slowly removed the part. The big dent on the corner was my next problem. If I tried to close the screen with that dent there, I would actually likely shatter the display glass. In an attempt to fix it, I'm going to try flattening that piece of metal in a vise. I cut several pieces of wood into various shapes to help straighten the casing out. I didn't want the vise making direct contact with the metal of the casing as it would leave unwanted marks. The bottom casing was in dire need of a dusting. My vacuum cleaner and brush made short work of that. To get the stubborn gunk out of the air vents, I used a toothbrush. My first attempts were a little awkward, but I eventually made some good progress. The final block of wood fit in perfectly, allowing me to apply lots of pressure to the case without damaging the sides. I was also able to flatten out the side with the battery indicator as well. I had nearly gotten all the surfaces perfectly flat. Over the next day, I kept it in the vise, changing the position every few hours. Since the rubber feet were about to fall off, I thought I would put a whole new set of them on. It's pretty obvious that someone had tried gluing them back on in the past. Using some sticker removal really helped get rid of the glue. To try and reduce the appearance of scratches, I used some silver polish on the base of the laptop. I should probably have opened a window for this as the fumes were kind of strong. Using a bit of eucalyptus oil, I cleaned off the residue. Sadly, it didn't have any noticeable effect on the scratches. I always love this part, putting in the new rubber feet. I use the end of a spudger to press it in place. Since they have adhesive on the back, there's no need for glue. This MacBook can now sit properly once again. The cooling fans can now be cleaned out. We can actually get inside these ones, which makes them a lot easier to clean. They're not that dusty, which is a bit anticlimactic, but probably a good thing to see. Using a brush, I gave them a dust out. I got the massive bulge on the top case nearly completely flattened out. While the side is still a bit scratched up, it's far less bent as well. With the casing bent back into shape, I gave it a clean off. Now was a good time to scrub the portholes as well. They're much harder to clean when the logic board is back in place. The edge near the screen hinge also needed bending back into shape. I put a bit of paper on the end of a pair of pliers so that the metal casing wouldn't get too scratched up. This was quite effective, although I did manage to scratch the casing when the paper started to fall apart. The battery indicator could now be screwed back in, and luckily I didn't break any of the mounting points as I warped the case back into shape. When I restore computers, I try and use as many of the original parts as possible. This reduces waste and makes things a whole lot cheaper, but the display assembly is truly too far gone. The hinges are beyond repair, so I'm actually going to be putting in a brand new display assembly. And by brand new, I mean one I'm taking off of a laptop that I used in a previous video. It was the one that had a faulty GMUX chip. My solution was actually to press the chip down with some cardboard. Thankfully, this screen will be compatible with the Mac we're fixing. Slotting in the new display was pretty easy. Given how bent the old hinges were, I thought I would test putting in all the screws before adding Threadlocker. 
One of the screws went in on an angle, but once it was all the way in, it straightened up. Threadlocker keeps the screws from coming loose over time, and if your laptop screen is wobbly, there's a good chance you need to tighten these screws. The screws can still be removed quite easily when needed. The screen thankfully lines up very well. The new thermal paste can now be applied. I'm using Arctic MX4, which seems to be pretty good value for money. I also noticed a small amount of corrosion near the ports, and using some isopropyl alcohol helped clean them out. Next, the logic board slotted in. I installed a working battery and put in a new set of screws. Considering this laptop was missing literally all of them, $5 for a new set off eBay seemed reasonable. Fingers crossed, let's hope it turns back on. So far, so good. Everything appears to be working normally, minus the discreet graphics processor. Now, with this Frankenstein of a laptop back together, I think it's time we give it a clean, starting things off with a healthy dose of eucalyptus oil. The only surface left to clean is the keyboard and trackpad area. Using a Q-tip, I made sure to get between the keys. Laptops can be filthy things, so be sure to clean them. The screen was also very clean as it was off one of my other MacBooks, so I just gave it a wipe with a microfiber cloth. So there we have a much improved MacBook Pro. The large bulging dent is nearly completely flat, allowing us to easily close the lid. I think it's time we try and see just what this laptop is capable of, minus the discrete graphics processor. Since these MacBooks get really hot before they spin up the fans, I'm manually setting the fan speeds to keep the temperatures down. First, we've got Minecraft running at these settings. In a fairly griefed area on my server, the frame rate stays around 50. This is very playable. Another game that's still very playable is Old School RuneScape. I remember the first laptop I ever played this on back in 2007. It had a weak AMD single core processor. Since Cinebench R20 is mainly testing the CPU performance, it scores a respectable 1032. The graphical benchmark, Unigen Heaven, unsurprisingly struggled quite a bit. Since this relies heavily on the graphics processor, the weak Intel HD3000 didn't do that well at all. It's safe to say you won't be very competitive if you play Counter-Strike Global Offensive on this laptop. Even at the lowest graphical settings, I couldn't get it to be playable. Another game that did work right on here was Terraria. Getting around 30 frames per second, you could comfortably play it on here. Hello guys and welcome back to yet General web browsing and HD YouTube playback was smooth as butter, well within the integrated graphics capability. Overall, despite not having a discrete GPU anymore, this laptop runs perfectly fine, and as long as you're not doing any graphically intensive tasks, you could get by using this. Alright, this is what you've been waiting for. Can we resurrect that dodgy AMD graphics processor? As I said earlier, the method of using a heat gun is at best only a temporary fix, if it even works. So once again, I took out the logic board. By this point, I could have done it with my eyes closed. Removing the heat pipes, we see all that fresh thermal paste. Since we're going to be heating up the GPU to over 200 degrees Celsius, the paste has to come off. In fact, I need it to be incredibly clean and free of debris. With the paste removed, I flushed under the graphics processor with some isopropyl alcohol. This will evaporate very quickly. A few people on Twitter recommended I warm the whole board up before I heat gun the GPU. So I removed the delicate speaker and microphone which could easily be damaged even at the low temperatures in the oven. Using a ruler, I measured the dimensions of the chip. To shield the working components on the logic board from the extreme heat, I made an aluminium foil pouch with several layers. With a small blade, I cut out a slot for the GPU. With the foil pouch in place, I put it in the oven at a low temperature. This is simply to warm the whole board up. I'd be guessing I was told to do this to reduce the chance of cracking when the board is introduced to the high temperatures of the heat gun. I'm using an inexpensive 2000 watt heat gun from Bunnings. I've set the temperature to about 230 degrees Celsius. I made sure that I kept moving the nozzle around, not leaving it in the same place for long. 
I continued this for just over 5 minutes, momentarily stopping every 20 seconds or so. With the laptop back together yet again, did it survive the heating? After pushing in the power button, it thankfully sprung back into life, so at the very least I didn't kill it. But the discrete graphics processor is still disabled. So after resetting the NVRAM and forcing macOS to run with the discrete graphics processor, it actually booted up. There were some weird glitches, but it is indeed using the discrete GPU. The DOS Dude patch does remove the AMD drivers, which is probably why the system thinks it's hooked up to a 23 inch external monitor. After reinstalling macOS with the correct drivers loaded, it ran perfectly. I had to use 10.7 since my Sierra install USB wouldn't work, but the discrete graphics processor now works fine. It could very well fail again in the near future, so what I've done is not a permanent fix. So there we have it, a truly trashed MacBook Pro returned to a functional state. The heat gunning method actually worked, which I was very surprised about, however it is only at best a temporary fix, and it's only a matter of time before the GPU finally dies. Anyway, big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. If you've liked the video, feel free to leave a like, and if you want to see more, definitely consider subscribing. I'll see you in the next video.